Hello everyone, welcome to my spoiler video for Parhelion. Uh, I'm going to be spoiling three cards today. I'm going to show them up on screen in just a moment, but before I do, if you're going to uh, grab them and bounce, which I totally understand, please consider giving me a like, hitting that subscribe button. Uh, it helps me get found by other people, and it's really rewarding for me to see my videos get liked and shared around. Um, I, I really... Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to see that people enjoy things I make. This video is going to be about these three cards, but it's going to be also about the role that, that uh, AI breakers have played historically in the meta and how these cards might fit in. So the three cards are Tunnel Vision, Nanook, and Matryoshka. These are all AI breakers, and I think they're going to do various things to the metagame and be pretty interesting cards in their own right, even if maybe they're not going to all take over the meta by storm. So the first thing I want to talk about is like AI breakers. Like they're a really interesting concept um, or they're a really interesting spin on parts of, on a part of Netrunner, uh, which is that they break one of the core rules or what is sort of assumed to be one of the core rules of you have to match an icebreaker to an ice type. And AIs just say, no, you don't. And so usually they require a lot of work to make that happen. And so historically, the AIs have fallen into four categories. Unplayable, build around, engine pieces, and remote busters. And so I'm going to go through all those. I'm going to talk about some examples and where those, where those cards have particularly shined. So I'm going to start with build arounds. These are AIs that you build your whole deck around using this card. There's like kind of three archetypical examples in my mind. The biggest one is Otten. Um, and I know there's going to be a card that I'm putting in another category that I know some people will I'll be like, why is this not in this area? I ask you to hold on for a moment. But Otman is was one of the premier build arounds to me. From my perspective, uh, it was a really interesting puzzle to make work. It ended up being used with Leech and Data Sucker a lot. And I actually have a video where I go and talk through building this deck of Otman in startup. And I think the deck was perfectly serviceable and actually still a lot of fun to play. Um, and this I built based on riffs on historical decks that were quite good for a period of time in Netrunner. Other examples include Overmind, and this is maybe a little bit less of an obvious build around, but the idea was generally you wanted to get lots of MU and then not use it. You wanted to install as few programs as possible, and so Overmind was really the one of the premier ways to get around uh, and break things. And Eater is the last one where it's like, uh, the reason I put this in the build around as opposed to another category, the next category, um, which it definitely is a little fuzzy, uh, is that Eater's downside of you can access zero cards is almost always a downside. So you it, it was run in decks that had other ways of getting value off of successful runs other than getting the accesses. Um, so the big cards were account siphon, uh, keyhole, and these other sort of run replacement effects that were incredibly impactful. The next set of AIs uh, are sort of engine pieces. These are a part of a package of cards. So the card themselves is very good, but it's usually not the only way you're breaking ice or even the way you're planning to break ice throughout the whole game. But what they do is they tide you over some portion of the game or whether that's the early game or maybe the late game, though that's a little less common. Um, and they often are just slotted in because they solve a particular problem for you particularly well, or they synergize with the rest of your game plan so well it seems silly not to include them. So the obvious example of this to me is Amakua. Uh, this card is run in essentially every criminal deck, but the numbers have varied a lot depending on the time and the meta. No criminal deck is a Amakua or bus deck, but almost all of them are an Amakua when it's beneficial for me deck. Brahmin was a card that uh, I played a lot in Shaper and basically the same area, especially in 2019 when we had Downfall and I wanted to reset the uh, the Math Breakers, Euler, and Gauss. Brahman was a really nice way to keep doing that infinitely. And I'm going to also mention the other card here, which is Faust. Faust sort of straddles these categories. It was probably one of the best kind of... It was very much a build-around breaker, so it probably belonged in the previous category. But it was also never 
the card that you ran solely on its own. It was basically always combined with Parasite and David to be part of a full package that was in particular quite strong. So those are sort of the two, like, I'm going to build my whole strategy around these sets of AIs, or they're going to be a core part of my strategy. And I think those are really interesting AIs because um, they pose some real, uh, they're, they're, they're often quite tricky to balance, and they're very uh, distinct. Like, only one of them is going to be right for your deck at any given point in time. And because, you know, due to the faction you are, but also just do the whole way your deck is constructed. The last category of AIs, I think of actually as much more universal. And these are remote buster AIs. And these are cards that usually fall off really hard in the late game. Um, they have some kind of anti-scaling mechanic. They usually trash themselves or remove themselves from the game or um, get hosted on ice so they can be interacted with by the corp or just sometimes have really bad numbers. But what, you, what they're good at is the part of the AI breaker that says you can break any type, any subroutine on any type of ice. The two premier examples to this in terms of playability are Knight and Mayfly. Both of these cards did see play for doing things other than just remote busting, but their primary purpose was to make a few high impact runs. And so the idea here is like Knight is a pretty bad breaker to use the entire game. It was more okay back in its day when everything was worse, but still pretty rough. And Mayfly has the very obvious downside of you only get to use it for one run. And so you have these sort of limitations on this breaker, but what it's really good for is saying, hey, in Knight's case, I don't really even need that much money. I have probably two to four credits and I'm gonna get through basically any ice in the game. Mayfly, you need a lot of money, but it just says you can turn this money into a successful run and nothing's going to stop you, uh, at least ice-wise. There are obviously a lot of... I didn't mention more AI breakers than I did mention. And I think that's one of the big things, is that AIs have typically been very, very bad or kind of broken. And I think it's because of how difficult it kind of is to land on... Um, this this very delicate balance of being able to break one of the core rules of the game of breaking all types of ice and then making the economic cost of that noticeable without making it uh unsurmountable and for most ais it is just in fact insurmountable this was a very brief overview of ais uh probably i'm doing under serving a lot of them. Faust in particular, I think, like I would I need to get I need to find someone to do a record reconstructor and we can just talk about um Dumble well not Dumble Fork, but just well I guess Dumble Fork is a decent name for it. But just this the the Faust lit basically Faust uh Wildside adjusted chronotype, also called pancakes, just ran over the entire meta for over a year and completely warped uh, the whole game of Netrunner, and honestly, all of the ice that was printed for a very, very long time. Um, so I think it's like, even though there's not that many AI breakers that I think make the list of AI breakers that have completely changed the game, Faust has maybe changed the game more than almost any other card. Other notable ones on the runner side being stuff like Account Siphon, Parasite, Self-Modifying Code, like... Faust is one of the most powerful runner cards in the context of it of Netrunner at the time and shape and only became less good because the entire card pool was basically designed to gang up on it. And for a long time, that wasn't enough. Faust was still so good that it still ran the meta. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of people are excited for AI breakers. Um, I think there are always this really interesting uh, challenge of how, what categories is this going to solve and how are you going to make the costs of this AI breaker relevant without making them either binder fodder or just the cost is, is some cases not a cost, in other cases a, a lower cost than you would pay in other ways. All right, so I've rambled on, I've, I've filled some time. Let's talk about the actual cards in some detail. 
So first up, we have Tunnel Vision. This is a two cost, two MU program, Icebreaker AI. It says when your turn begins, identify your mark. If you don't have a mark, a random central server becomes your mark for this turn. And then interface, two credits, break up the two subroutines on a piece of ice protecting your mark. And then two credits plus two strength and has a base strength of two. Lots of twos on this ice. Basically every number on this ice is a two, which is sort of funny. Um, and you know, this card is, I think it's not the, it's, it doesn't read as the strongest card. And I think it's sort of, it's, it's not a, it's not like an engine card. I can't make my whole game plan around the idea of this tunnel. So it has to be some kind of support role. And then the thing when you're evaluating a card in a support role is you go, okay, well, what role, like what conditions is it going to take? for this card to be worth a supporting role in my slot. Now, Tunnel Vision is gonna be good when we want to run our mark nearly every turn. And there's and we're anticipating the corp is gonna have a reason to ice up every central server. We're playing criminal so we get HQ for free. Now, Tunnel Vision is now nice. It means I don't have to use a one-use card, like a, well, boomerang, I'm gonna call a one-use card. Um, to combo with an event like Diversion of Funds or Legwork or, I don't know, something else. We're gonna, um, so I can combine this card with other high impact, oh, um, or, uh, shoot, I just had it. What was that card called? Run HQ. Name a card type, access two cards. If you access one of those cards, reveal two cards. If either the revealed card is of the name type, trash it and gain four credits. It is called Bummer. I have to go look this up. And this is all gonna get cut together to look wonderful. Embezzle. Embezzle is the card I'm thinking of. So if we're playing a, a criminal deck, that's heavy on these sort of central effects. And what we probably would need to do is combine, have, a, have a critical mass of these so that if my mark is on archives, R&D, or HQ, I can get value out of this. A card that would be nice is something like security testing. But if you're paying credits with tunnel vision, you're not making any value off of the security testing. So we need something better than just security testing. One obvious piece of synergy with this one is Virtuoso. Now this Tunnel Vision says, hey, if I install Virtuoso and Tunnel Vision, I get to access a card from HQ every turn, provided I have the credits for it. Maybe we combine this with Leech, and now any three strength piece of ice, we get to see a card from HQ for two credits. That starts looking pretty good. The tricky thing is that, obviously, you can't control where the mark is going to go. There's going to be games where you have Tunnel Vision installed, and the corp hasn't iced up archives and you just keep rolling archives over and over and over again. And that feels pretty bad. So it's, it's tricky to figure out exactly how you're gonna support this card. One card I would shout out that has been spoiled already uh, from, or that came out in Midnight Sun is the twinning. Twinning works really well because two thirds of the time you're gonna be able to turn a tunnel vision, uh, you're gonna be able to turn twin encounters into extra accesses with tunnel vision. So, I think this card's really interesting support. It probably won't see much play, if any, outside of Sable, but I think it's, an, it's a way for Sable to try and keep a mark-based engine running. And if we see some more mark support pieces throughout the rest of uh, Arhelion, then I think this could go places. Next up, let's talk about Nanook. Uh, Nanook is uh, yet another programmer icebreaker AI. It's almost like it, they're all a theme. Uh, it, this one costs four to install and is also 2MU. Um, and it says, when this program is uninstalled, remove it from the game. When agenda is scored or stolen, remove this program from the game. Interface two credits, break up the two subroutines, one credit, plus one strength, and a base strength of three, 
which is really impactful. I think this card is very clearly kind of a remote buster. This card just says, hey, especially if I'm Cabanessa Wu, and this program would probably be uninstalled anyway, I get a turn, I can pull this out of my deck, have a base strength three AI breaker, and I can get into your remote. So in metas where the corp is trying to protect a, uh, a five three behind two pieces of ice early in the game or in the mid game, Nanook is, is probably one of the strongest cards you could install. This to me is probably the scariest icebreaker of, of the full set we're gonna talk about today. Um, purely because I think this, this card does a lot. The downside it has of it becomes uninstalled pretty often is a significant downside. But this is a five influence Shaper card and Shaper is a faction that's really good at getting their program just in the time that they need them. And this card is a fantastic card to have just in time. I think there's, a, I should, I, I would be remiss not to mention that there are also ways to kind of steal agendas without actually stealing them. Um, in Eternal, uh, you can just play Nanook and Film Critic, and uh, I don't think you ever need to run another Icebreaker again. Um, but I think more relevantly for Standard and for Startup, uh, well, I guess not for Startup anymore, but is Imp and Stargate. Both of these cards mean that you don't have to steal the agenda. You can just leave it in archives to come back for, come, can come back to and get later, possibly with a mad dash. So I think Nanook is a just pretty wildly strong card um, and it's going to shine especially in a meta full of five threes. I think in a meta with lots of x2 you know two ones, three ones, three twos and four twos, it's going to have a bit more of a struggle because usually you have to steal four cards or sometimes even more to actually go and win win out on the game and then you can only ever get you three and if you ever install one, miss and it stays installed, you're pretty likely to lose your access to Nanook if an agenda is fast advanced or scored uh, in some other fashion. So I think this card is genuinely a little a little terrifying um, and and quite powerful uh, in the right situation. And shapers are going to be explaining this and using it a lot. And finally, uh, oh, and Nanook is very clearly a, uh, a remote buster card, which I think I mentioned at the top. I just want to make sure I include. All right, and finally, we've got Matryoshka. This is our build around AI of the set. This is a three cost 2MU. So all of these AIs are 2MU, uh, is a program icebreaker, and it says when your turn begins, Turn each hosted card face up, huh? Then it has the ability click. Host a program of Matryoshka from your grip face up on this program. It is not installed is the reminder text. Then interface X, turn one hosted copy of Matryoshka face down. Break X subroutines. So the way this works is I can spend a click and three credits to install my first Matryoshka. The second Matryoshka I draw I use the click ability on the installed Matryoshka to then go and host the Matryoshka that's in my hand. Now the Matryoshka that I've installed gains the ability to interface, break any number of subroutines on one piece of ice, and then turn the hosted Matryoshka face down. I no longer have an interface ability, so I, with two cards in my deck down the board, I can break one piece of ice. And then with Two card, three cards down the board, I can break any two pieces of ice. And at the beginning of my turn, I get to flip all the Matryoshkas face up. And then I have uh, one to, and then I get plus one strength. So really this is a lot of text to say this is a one to break, one to boost icebreaker. That's actually phenomenal numbers. And it's got a base strength of two. Like genuinely this, while I say Nanook is the card I'm most worried about, I'm the most worried about it because Everyone's complaining about Shaper at the moment. This is an incredibly solid breaker that's hurt a little bit by probably being a bit slow. Um, but if you only ever want to break one, two, or three ice in a turn, which is something that you can get through a lot of mid games and with the right decks, particularly stuff like um, K 
counter surveillance decks, this could maybe carry you through the entire game where you're just looking to make runs on HQ through one to two ice, runs on the R&D through one to three ice. This is potentially a viable way to get through and the base numbers on this card are not atrocious. So once again, you know, this is uh, this is this card's trying to ride that line of having an interesting cost being a build around card. Because the other cost of this, of course, is that it's eating up a lot of deck slots. You probably could run less than six, but I think it starts to get pretty dodgy to run less than six and reliably find enough of these to break. Um, but this card really snowballs. If you see two or three, if you see three or four of these early, the corpse can have a really hard time scoring out without trying to make some kind of big economic advantage. But this card's going to really suffer in a world for, full of border controls, anoetic voids, and other sort of non-ice-based and the runs that can fire after all the ice gets broken. Um, this card is also pretty vulnerable to rig shooting. Usually AI breakers, AI breakers tend to go a little bit back and forth on rig shooting because often running three copies of an AI breaker means that rig shooting doesn't really hurt you. The corp has to hit you three times to turn off your deck, but then you suddenly fall off a cliff and are unable to do much of anything. Whereas with Matryoshka, once you've lost one that's hosting two or three copies, you may never see enough copies for the rest of the game to break more than one piece of ice, which is a huge cost uh, to playing this card. So for all that I'm worried about it, and I love to worry about my Netrunner cards, um, I think this one looks like a lot of fun to build around. Um, I know there's been talk about a neutral runner. Maybe this will work in it. Who knows? Um, but uh, I think this one will be a lot of fun to build around. Probably won't see the top tables, but you never know. This card definitely has some potential. So once again, here are the three AI breakers, Tunnel Vision, Nanook, and Matryoshka. Uh, Tunnel Vision is kind of an engine piece. Nanook is a remote buster. Matryoshka is probably a build around. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what these cards do in Parhelia. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you're enjoying spoiler season. Uh, please do like and subscribe. Uh, as I said at the top, it's, it's really great to see that people enjoy these videos. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to making content about the rest of Parhelion. And if for some reason you don't know this, I've been doing uh, nightly streams reviewing the day's spoilers on um, on my Twitch stream, which is just twitch.tv slash SC, just like this channel name. Uh, and those have been happening every night at 5.30 p.m. EST. You've probably seen them because I'm also spamming your YouTube feed. But if you haven't caught me live, uh, please, you know, come and stay, come and swing by. Uh, it's a lot of fun to interact with everyone in the chat, uh, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you next time. Bye.